So today we're going to be talking about hip impingement, or FAI, with Ben I. Matthew. And the idea is to, to bring about some better awareness of this condition and, um, and talk about some perhaps some teaching resources later with you, Ben. Um, so we've got two patients that have had this condition, both happen to be physios, which is, which is a sort of rather unique uh, webinar situation here. Both are good at hips themselves, but they, they went to see Ben, because Ben, I got to know you personally because of your experience in this in this area. Because I didn't have any any knowledge about hip and groin, and you are uh, you're the man. So, and I suppose that that's where the two other physios went went to see your help, right? Um, so we're going to talk about their journey thus far with your guidance. Um, so, you guys, uh, Aiden and Dan, do you want to just uh, go one at a time and just to, just to briefly summarise your position as physios and perhaps a little bit about your journey with your FAI hip impingements? Yeah. Dan, you got So I'm quite new to physio, so I've only been qualified two years. Um, so my background is um, a sport therapy uh, bachelor's degree, and then I went on to do an, an S&C master's. Um, but because of back issues, I ended up not going in down that route. Um, became a PE teacher for four years and then ended up back at physio. So, and you still look 23. Have you managed all of that? I'm, in that time? I'm 31. Oh, get out of here. <laughs> I am. Goodness yeah. me, without oh, my right. hair. That's outrageous. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm working at Guys and St. Thomas's at the moment, uh, band five rotation for physio. Um, I went to Benoit probably around six months ago or maybe more than that. Um, started to get symptoms in my hip, um, just a, a slight ache in my groin. Um, and that was about a couple of years after I had a, a micro discectomy on my back. So I started to do a lot more lunging movements again. I think I increased the volume too quickly and then started to feel the, the symptoms in my hip. Um, it's not very problematic. It's probably only, a, well, it's a zero at the moment. I'll maybe get a one or a two out of ten. Um, it maybe just catches when I'm changing direction to go somewhere if I'm sitting for long periods. Um, and I just wanted to get it sorted sooner rather than later um, and then run into problems further down the line. So I went to Benoit. Very wise. And Aidan, a little bit about you. Uh, so um, I'm qualified physio now for the past six years. I uh, studied in Brighton University, a background in sports uh, therapy in Ireland, moves over here, did my undergrad, and then I went on to, well, currently I put it off during COVID, my uh, postgrad in sports exercise medicine. Um, but I have a keen interest in, in sports in general. I used to row quite a lot, played football growing up, a lot of field-based sports as an adolescent. And then uh, over the past couple of years, I took up a lot of running and triathlon. I signed up to a big event later this well. It was actually due to be last week, but I put it off because of the, the issue I had. Um, and then I was doing a lot of training over the winter months and I just started to develop <coughs> kind of tension in the, in the right groin area. And, and it just started presenting with tightness and soreness and, and it affected my training. And then I tried to rehab it, thinking it was a tendon-related issue course i failed <laughs> and it wasn't it wasn't responding as you would expect with a tendon injury so you know having listened to a lot of the the physio edge and the other podcasts uh, that ben i done around hip and groin i realized okay there could be something else going on here and i reached out to him with his expertise and you know thankfully um he, uh, he's very clear with the with the kind of prognosis and the time frame of it and you know, the expectations were set and then i think that really that really helps because you know even as a physio we do want things to kind of heal quick we want to get back doing the things that we love doing um, and yeah. but it was i think the one of the great things he said was he gave me a realistic time frame and then that made me then align my goals to that time frame um, and it was just very clear guidance throughout and once I, you know, reached those benchmarkers, I was able to go on to the next phase. And, and then I progressed through those, you know, really well. And, at, you know, before I had this recent knee issue, I was back to running, you know, 10 kilometers, three times a week, minimal hip pain and, and, and groin pain. And it was just getting better. And to, to this day, I saw him back in April um, and now in July, and I don't get any 
pain in my hip day to day. I might get as um, as, uh, as as Dan. Dan said. Yeah, sorry, Dan. As Dan said, every now and then I might catch when I change positions, etc. But nothing to the point where it was. You know, I was struggling at work. Um, yeah, sure. You know, I was getting pain day to day activities, putting on you know socks, etc. Was yeah. So luckily, all that has now been resolved. Very good news. So, so Ben, can you just talk everyone through a little bit about, give a summary of what FAI is and hip impingement, as is otherwise known? Yeah, so it's relatively a new condition. Uh, it was first described in 1999, so even after I've graduated, so it just tells our age that, you know, a lot of things you learn at school, you never, a lot of things come later. So it's a fairly recent condition. And uh, I would say, uh, you know, the evidence is quite clear. It's an extremely common condition in young active people. So the two most common conditions I see in clinic with hip and groin is hip impingement and GTPS. So that's pretty much my bread and butter. Those two conditions are what I see. So if I generally you see in a more, so the way I explain to patients rather than making it complex. So if you look at the literature, you got the cam, the pincer makes it. For me, it's basically a mismatch between your uh, shape of your hip and your lifestyle. So it's pretty much a mismatch. Like, you know, a lot of people have this morphology. If you look at the evidence, anywhere from 20 to 50% of people will have a cam and pincer but they rarely get any symptoms because very few people will push their body to that limit. So when there's a spike, just like a tendinopathy, when there's a spike in their training, they've done too much. Like, for example, Aiden's case, there was some subtle changes in his bike. So he had made some changes. He's, you know, he got a more aerodynamically better bike, but that hip was not happy with it. And then there was a spike. And, in and, his and sorry to interrupt. That's the perfect example was Dan's, wasn't it? Because he was talking yeah. about managing his back. We're doing lunging and so forth. Yes. Yeah. So he's bringing up his hip into flexion more, then gets the symptoms, but he already probably had an underlying predisposition. Well, predisposition. Right. So we all have, so uh, the, that usually the shape of the hip is, is usually determined by the age of, one of the questions I ask my patients when they come is, how active you are from the age of 8 to 18? Because that will tell me whether they're more likely to have a, an impingement morphology. So if you've done a lot of sports like Aiden, you know, he was doing, you know, a lot of stuff, football or, you know, Gaelic stuff and, you know, rotational stuff and same with Danny, or, you know, the golf and other thing. If you do a lot of rotational sports, high impact sports, you would expect that to be that shape. But then later in life, when you spike up your volume or you make some changes with your training, it seems to flare up. So I wouldn't really call it a, you know, like a disease process. It's basically a mismatch between the shape of your hip and your life. So something has to give. Either you change your lifestyle or you chop your uh, shape of hip. So it's always being very realistic of that because um, it's not something which happens overnight. You have that predisposition. And generally, your typical presentation is an active person. So um, anywhere from 20 to 40, it's very, very rare to see this after 40, 45, more likely to see hip OA. And as they mentioned, they have activity-related pain pain on sitting, pain on squatting. Uh, classical thing is they will complain of this uh, stiffness. So once they've done like a football or a cycling, they'll complain the subjective feeling of stiffness. Um, and then some of them will have this popping sensation, clicking, catching. Uh, one of the things I routinely ask my patients, both men and women is, do they have pain during sex, uh, which is something which commonly many, and especially like you and me, we deal with male pelvic health is something we routinely ask uh, how does that affect your sexual activity? And a lot of these patients uh, is something like 90% in women and at least 70 to 80% men will have pain during sexual intercourse and mentally it brings them down. You know, they can't do the things they, they enjoy. Uh, pain, you know, pain during squatting activities, loss of range. Uh, and by the time they come to me, many of them might be limping and they have night pain. So it's a quite a complex presentation and it's a very variable presentation as well. So, um, and uh, most people like, you know, they'll think it's a tendon issue like a hip flexor injury or erector tendon injury and they'll rehab it for two, three months and usually it won't improve and then they come to me because they think it's, because most therapists or most patients don't want to believe it's a joint problem. They want to blame the joint, b blame the tendon, but it's usually the thing. And so that's why they come to me up with a place of frustration. So it's definitely the most, the literature is very clear. It's the most common injury chronic. If, if you have somebody like an active person who comes with um, deep-seated hip and groin pain with symptoms more than three months, you, you pretty much 60% of the time it will be uh, hip impingement. So it's much more com common than we think it was. So it's quite... Yeah. Yeah, but is, is there, is there but, a sex difference between... Uh, yeah, in, in so this slightly, yeah. Yeah, so generally, like GTPS, we know it's four is to one 
with the women whereas if you look at the literature most of the literature has been done in young active males whereas in the clinic i see i would say 60 to 70% are females so it's slightly not like gtps i would say it's slightly more towards the female um than the male but if you look at top professional places like football rugby it's predominantly all men but maybe it's maybe more men do that sports so right. if you're if you're a normal msk clinic i would say it's 60 40 so 60 would be females 40 would be men but if you're working if you're working with elite sports it'll be predominantly males right and so when when you've got someone in that that has you mentioned this 60 to 70% of people over 3 months mm. that clearly leaves you with 30 odd percent mm. and i've just made this my mistake myself where i was actually somewhere between a tendon and and actually the patient in the end had an arthritic hip but she was young mm. so so what talk us through about how you, you you would decide whether this definitely was what kind of test do you use to get to that point where they definitely have got it yeah i think it's a difficult uh decision the most i think the most challenging uh element when you deal with hip and groin is to see whether your symptoms are from the hip or outside the hip is an intraarticular or extraarticular and that can sometimes take me two three sessions to get my head around it uh i think the case with aiden and danny was much easier because they already had the scans and they knew their shapes of the hip already but generally right. if you have if you have patients come in i think you can't really make the decision on the first session it's it's very tricky uh, because uh, if again to make it more difficult uh, about 60% of patients with uh, fa syndrome also have severe low back pain as well so a lot of them will have back pain uh, because they're losing the mobility so it's quite common for them to have back pain with uh, hip impingement as well so generally the there are key clinical few uh, is so generally it's activity related it's very rare to see hip impingement in somebody like uh, like me you know who doesn't push the body <laughs> to the limit i'm just going a bit of biking because if you got an inactive person it's extremely unlikely and generally if it's more than 45 plus generally more likely to be oa than an impingement so it's a young man's it's a young person's disease and it's uh, another key point is it's not people want i use i ask them to use the finger and pinpoint where the pain is and they won't be able to tell you where the pain is so they'll come with a c sign they'll point you know they'll just do this sort of sawing action on the groin they can never ever pinpoint at an ex- exact point so it's quite deep vague non specific things like that and obviously you know that tells you it's more intraarticular and uh, the problem with the hip test like the impingement test or the faber test and things like that they're pretty much positive for everything so they're quite uh, hmm. sensitive but not specific so you can you can do that pretty for most people it'll be positive so it's useful to exclude things but not to really uh, uh, make the diagnosis and uh, some studies have shown there's a restriction in flexion and internal rotation so it's good to compare that both the sides you know uh, check that and uh, fortunately we got a consensus from Warwick which uh, I attended in 2016 which says to make a diagnosis of hip impingement you need three things you need the symptoms which is like pain or stiffness or dysfunction you need the uh, clinical signs which is positive impingement test or lack of flexion or internal rotation and third is you can't diagnose hip impingement without an x-ray so that's where i think it's different from tendinopathy or back pain or knee pain without an x-ray you don't need an mri like an ap view or a lateral view you will you can't really say it's impingement because you have to exclude osteoarthritis you have to exclude dysplasia so that's where it becomes problematic for many therapists should we x-ray them or should we wait till we scan them so officially and uh, for all you know scientific purposes hip impingement needs a triad of three things symptom signs and imaging sure. so i mean go go back to you dad at the start of your symptoms i mean you showed you how different your symptom pictures were actually which is why this is quite difficult to pin down Can you just I mean obviously you're a fit guy you're doing lunges I'm an osteopath so my my rehab knowledge is is pretty poor although I'm getting there with people like Ben's help but so you're fit you're active you know you know now that your your glutes are firing as they probably should be or whatever else so can you just summarize the journey you went through so when you met Ben you saw pretty much knew your diagnosis already I guess and then how 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 did Ben structure that moving forwards with you at the start so w- with phase 1 the main um focus was on um mobility and also some glute strengthening um so i did that for around 6 to 8 weeks um which was which was great it um it just helped me um in the gym and i was also aware of the positions that i need that i couldn't go into so deep hip flexion um i avoided so things like lunging and split squats i would only go down to around 85 degrees of hip flexion just to avoid that um that uh, impingement 
So do you, do you think you were trying to work through it previously to seeing Ben? You thought maybe it was good to push through some of the pain a little bit? Well, the same with Aiden. I thought it was a groin, like a uh, adductor tendon problem or something like that. Um, right. That's what it felt like. It felt like a bit of a pull. So I, right. I assumed that it was something to do. It was muscular or um, tenderness. So um, I was just going into deep um, hip flexion still um, because obviously I wanted to go into full range of movement and, uh, mm. you know, get the best activation in my quads as I could. So um yeah so i was i was going into deep hip flexion and it just it just started to slowly get worse um and i I was assessed by a few other physios but no one could really reproduce the pain that i was getting so um with um with like the fabers test um and the fadir there was nothing um so i went to benoit and um oh sorry Initially, I did go to an osteopath whilst I was in Spain last year. <laughs> oh dear. Um, and um, he's, he's a family friend, so he sent me for an x-ray. I got the x-ray the next day. Oh, well done. Um, so we could see what was going on. And then when I got back from holiday, I then went to um, Beno and um, we, we started the process. Right, so, okay. Um, so stage one was mobility and glute strengthening. And the second stage was um, hip flexor, adductor, and um, like core strengthening. Um, okay. I was working on that alongside maintaining the hip mobility and the glute strength that I'd already started. Well, hip mobility within pain-free range as such. Yeah. Yeah. Because I guess the education bit at that point was like, okay, I can't keep pushing through and having pain because this is just going to keep irritating it. Yeah. So um, the stuff that we, we were doing was um, some hip openers with the gliders. I don't know if, you, if you've seen those. The, right. No. They, they slide along the floor, basically. So we oh, would, Okay. I was doing those. Um, I was also using some uh, CrossFit bands for like band distraction whilst whilst doing stretches. Um, okay. And I was using those to prepare as a warm up, really, and also um, on other days that I wasn't going to the gym. So it, it kind of worked as a warm up, like preparation for what I was doing. Right. Uh, so just uh, maintenance mobility as well. And were you taking analgesia at the same time, NSAIDs or anything like that, to calm the pain down? using any other things to help reduce the pain i i don't think i was it wasn't it wasn't too bad it would only really get to a three or a four right but it was at the point where i thought i needed to get it managed quickly um mm. you know, so it, so it doesn't evolve into oa in the future mm. okay. or any lab- label problems which i think uh, correct me if i'm wrong but some of the pain is where the labrum's irritated is that is that right yeah, yeah. It's totally it's the inflammation of the capsule and the labrum. And you're totally right. You don't want to push through that and come to a stage where you have extensive cartilage loss where it becomes much harder. I think one of the things I want to point out right from the beginning is obviously the I would say the two key reasons, you know, they these two guys have done really well. I like to thank them for sharing the journeys. Number one, I think, is they came to me quite early, which is quite unusual for blokes. <laughs> Usually, you know, they'll come way down after two years while they're dragging their legs. You know, most guys come very late with their health issues, uh, which is quite a bit of a sad reality with most parts of that. So I think these guys came quite early, which makes my job easier. And the second, I think the most important was they followed everything I said by the by the letter. You know, if I said no cycling for four weeks, or six weeks, eight, and said yes. You know, there was absolutely no, there was total trust from both the sides. So I think that makes your job easy. You know, if you say something and the patient does something, you're never going to win it. So I think those two points are really important is that uh-huh. the teamwork, uh, total, you know, respect on the timelines, boundaries. Uh, so I never had to argue anything or have that. So I said, this is, you don't do it for six weeks or you don't do it for eight weeks. So they trusted the process. And uh, obviously it's good to discuss that, but you need to trust the process rather than, trying to do your own thing and you never get but a part of, but, but ben, a part of that is that people can't see on the webinar is that you're 19 stone and six foot seven you, you're a bit <laughs> you're a bit intimidating you know you look small on camera but you know we all know in real life you, you're bringing the weight you're bringing some move to the room right yeah. i guess um, it's easier when you when you assume people assume like a specialist and their complaints better I, th- I found that when they seek a second opinion third opinion they reach their wits end and they sort of think, okay, I'm going to do whatever it takes. You know, maybe that could be a factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now, Aiden, how, how, was, how was your pain at the start of all of this? Did you did you do anything in terms of taking medications, do anything to help your pain so you could get moving better? Prior to seeing Benoit? Yeah, yeah. 
Um, well, I like uh, Dan said, I tried to treat it as a tendon. So I trained yeah, yeah. a certain level of pain and listening to that kind of 24 responses you would with a tendon. And, and yeah. I got nowhere with it after about six to eight weeks. And then when I saw Benoit, like he said, I went to him in a place of frustration. Mm. You know, I, I was quite irritable. Um, like you said, you know, things like, you know, <laughs> you I mean, mean you, you, you mean you were irritable, or the, or the, the, <laughs> it was quite irritable, right? Like you said, you know, and sometimes it can be an awkward uh, thing for us therapists to, to discuss, but like having sex was just really painful, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, you know, I just wasn't able to take part in 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 activities like cycling and other things as well. So, and I, you know, I'm very passionate about all of that stuff. And he made it clear from the outset, look, Aiden, the first point we need to do is just we need to calm the area down. We want to, you know, I think I said, to him, okay, so essentially treat it like a stress injury, pain-free loading. And he said, yes. Yeah. And, and that really helped because I would have I would have worked through a certain level of discomfort and you just continue yeah. that mm-hmm. cycle. So he said, look, if we can keep it, if we can get your activities of daily living down to calm the yeah. area, <clears throat> took a course in the proxin for a couple of weeks to assist with that. And it was really about, you know, modifying sitting. Sitting in clinic was very uncomfortable. And I got up every kind of half an hour, set a timer. And that, after a couple of weeks, took my symptoms from, you know, a 7 out of 10 down to about a 3 to a 4, much more manageable. And yeah. then using the things like Dan suggested as well, you know, the the bands for those kind of hip openers. And, you know, he was very clear when he explained that, look, we're not distracting the hip. We know how strong it is, but it's good for symptom relief. And, you know, mm-hmm. I wasn't going putting bands saying, okay, I'm pulling the hip out. It was purely just to feel better after. And I did, you know, I did. Yeah, that yeah. And I felt a lot better after. And then we, you know, we just kind of progressed through the phases. Like he said, Aiden, look, no cycling for a number of weeks. I've got a, got a lovely little bike over there in the corner that has been <laughs> sitting pretty for about three months. And, you know, it was the bike when I changed positions, a lot of that flexion loading really, you know, really triggered it and, and you know, excuse my French, pissed it off, if you like. Yeah. And that was just a subtle change in position of the bike, was it? It wasn't just a new bike. It was- yeah, it was, you know, let's say kind of 45 degree angle and then just kind of leaning over an extra kind of 10, 15 degrees. Obviously that closed down the hip, you know. Yeah. If you think about going for four hour cycles on the weekend, that repetition really, really triggered it. So it was calming the area down, trying to maintain as much mobility and strength, and then just gradually progressed through those phases into kind of high impact biometric, uh, and then gradually back into running. Nice. So Ben, taking what they just said there, for everyone else who's, you know, sorry, there's a fly in front of me, um, simpletons like me, can you just summarize what a sort of, you know, if we, if we think about this as a sort of graded loading program in effect for the hip, yeah. you know, can you talk us through the sort of basic structure in, in, under, in under 90 seconds? Yeah, so I think the, I think the, uh, it's basically a day's course, but I'll try to. <laughs> so I think pretty much the core driving principle for hip impingement management is education and exercise based. You know, everything. Obviously, I do use a lot of adjuncts, you know, for the pain relief stuff, like the distraction. Sometimes I use focus shock wave, EMTT, and things like that. But if you ask me, the two most important pillars it's education and uh, exercise on that. So when you talk about education, it's being very clear on your do's and don'ts making them understand what is uh, what is pissing off their hips because most people don't understand the relationship between sitting and other stuff they're doing so we need to make that clear but not trying to threaten them and saying sitting is bad for the hip i I tend to say you're sensitized sitting will just irritate it and shut down your muscles so you know we don't want to create the fear that sitting is is going to damage your hips so i just say in this phase you just need to unload that um so that sort of clear ideas and the big thing is also give them substitutes because people like like Aiden, and Dan, you know, you can't stop them going to the gym. So giving them options like hip thrusters, you know, like a cardio skier, giving them, you need to give them options. You can't just say, don't squat. You know, they, they're not going to follow that, you know, so give them some very hard exercise without irritating the hip. So we need to give them substitutes. So because a lot of this feel good factor in the gym is that endorphins, you know, very important for mental health, you know, so you, you don't want to stop them from them. So give them substitutes. I tell them do's and don'ts, control the pain. And as Aiden said, I'm, I think one of the m- main things I've learned in the last four or five years is aggressively managing the pain. I think sometimes I can see where it, ge- it goes wrong with some of the therapy approach, especially with hip impingement, is not controlling the pain enough. 
So I really wanted to ram it down to three, three and below because these guys will do the exercise, whatever you tell them. That's not why they're here for me. It's about getting the pain under control to a very low level. And then your job is much easier. So I think that first six to eight weeks to even sometimes can take two months, really get down. And then when you come to the exercises, pretty much three, four key exercises group. So I usually start with the mobility. You know, obviously I can't change their, improve the range, but it's it does feel better for the patient. So I might use some bit of manual therapy on some patients if there is restrictions, range of motion, band exercises, and then obviously a graded strengthening. So I'll use a combination of trunk and core, hip strengthening, you know, de- rotational strengthening, and then progress them into functional stuff. Yeah, so there's a lot of similarity in um, like the way you would do with a, like a proximal hamstring tendon rehab. So calm it down really well and then build it up uh, with a very good, strong education. And I think, I think key point I want to emphasize is actually we've got evidence from, you know, from Joe Kemp's work is it takes three months for you to, so a lot of my patients, I say, don't expect improvement week by week. You're going to have bad weeks, good weeks. You're going to see improvement month by month. So that's the key message I say. So, you know, August will be better than July. September will be better than August. You're going to have a few bad days here and there. And the whole thing takes minimum of three months. And also, you will not f- find a major difference till six weeks. So don't ask me every week how my symptoms I never ask them every week how the symptoms are. So I give them about five, six weeks. And then I say, w- the only thing I'll ask them is anything making you worse. So I usually don't ask them, are you getting better? Because I'm not expecting them to get better for the first six to eight weeks. And um, But generally, you should have some improvement then. And it takes three months to have a significant effect. And then uh, the whole thing in some patients can take six months. So it's a bit... Just like I would say, like a tendon, it's not a quick fix, really. Sort of, but it's buying, getting that buy-in from patients for the whole whole journey. Uh, but what I find is, if you aggressively manage the pain in the first two three weeks, the patient journey is much easier because if your pain is less, the patients are happy to do what you want. So I really uh, emphasize sometimes in some patient like Aiden is lucky, like you know the pain, the anti-inflammatory work we used a bit of EMTT as well, which it helped. If that didn't respond for him then I would have sent him to somebody to inject his hip for a steroid injection to calm it down and then get him on the rehab. For me, I need the pain below sort of three. Uh, I, 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 for, I keep it very simple. He should not have night pain. He should be able to sit for at least half an hour and it should not be very severe. If you don't get that, you're not going to go anywhere with your rehab. So there's no point pushing your rehab if you're struggling with basic ADL. Like he can do, you can, he can do anything you want, like deadlift and squat, but if he's suffering with pain, you're not going to go well. So I think aggressively managing the pain with advice, painkillers, um, injections if needed, some hands-on treatment. So I think it's getting that engagement with the pain. And then once the pain is below at a bearable level and they're sleeping better, then I think everything becomes more enjoyable. Okay. So da- so <clears throat> where are you guys now at? So Dan, if we go back to your your back pain causing you to do more hip and lunges, are you back functionally doing those things now Dan or, or where are you at on your journey um I had an MRI two days ago and I've herniated three discs oh so. never mind that never mind that that's a, we're here about talking about your hip and how successful it was <laughs> get your back yeah so that's where I'm at now um right but the six-year gap of having um back surgery till now I've been great um my hip has been great so I was in I was in phase two of my hip rehab Right. Uh, I hardly had any pain at all. It would it would only catch if I was maybe you know changing direction to walk somewhere. Um, yeah, okay. If I, sat, if I sat down in a deep chair for longer than fifteen minutes, it would start to feel um, like it was aching a little bit. But apart from yeah. that, it was great. Okay, good. And, a- and Aiden, where are you? You back doing um, triathlons in Tokyo? Yeah, I wish I wish I was meant to be out in the Alps last week uh, doing the Alpes long course triathlon. But bloody hell, that's proper fit. I think I got oh. the escape, you know. But um, uh, so I got back to it was I think around June I started uh, doing kind of a phase return to to running. And again, he was kind of like a couch to 5K, but giving it time to, to, to yeah. reach that 5K realistically. And I did that, you know, all it was frustrating, walking, running, and kept the pain down. And then after I got to 5K, gradually built up to 8K, 10 kilometers, running three times a week, got back on the bike. And yes, there was times where you might trigger a very small flare, but, you know, I was pretty much back to full training, you could say. And then... Like uh, Dan, a chronic ACL tear, which I've had surgery on last week, but that never mind that. The hip is doing great. Fine, 
But it's still focusing on Ben's success. That's the main thing, right? Um, I, like one of the great things, uh, one thing that I found was so useful was, you know, he. I went into the session and he could see that, like psychologically, it was, it, I was struggling because I wanted yeah, yeah. to train. And he said, hey, look, let's just focus on the things that you, you can do, you know, you there's lots of stuff you can do. And I think that really helped me earlier on to not train through the pain to calm the hip down so i used a yeah, yeah. trainer getting in the pool using fins um so i thought i thought that that was that was really good to you know i mean as a physio to take that yeah, yeah. as well and implement it into my own practice and and with people with fai it, you know it's definitely worked controlling that pain early on and Ben, if we, if we go, we're just touching on that because Aiden's been really honest about how it affected you personally, right? Yeah. Is, I mean, you treat other conditions, of course you do, Ben, you're the hip man, but is there is there a particularly close association with with FAI and how it impacts you from a psychosocial point of view? Because yeah. I, I mean, I've, I've seen a few, it does, but obviously low back pain is what I see most of, and of course it does yeah. affect them on that. So this is similar, does it? You know, I'm, I'm assuming they're just not their physios yeah. extra frustrated because they can't fix themselves. Yeah. But... Yeah. Um, um, yeah, that's a great point because I, I was not aware for, of that in the first three, four years treating these guys. I used to think it just like a purely mechanical thing. And there have been studies which have shown the quality of life of somebody with a poorly controlled hip impingement is the same as somebody with end-stage hip OA. So imagine you've got somebody in his 20s and 30s, which is supposed to be your peak time of your life, you know, where you're going to enjoy your life, training, family, kids and all that. And you're suffering mm -hmm. with this pain. So the effect psychologically is massive. So that's why I usually send them. I think both of those guys, I, what I find with blokes is they don't open up straight away in the first session. So what I tend to do with guys is I'll always send them an email. I'll send them an outcome score with all those questions. So I'll screen their psychological profile. So those two guys, I would have sent their paper where I, I get everything. So I look at their mental health. I look at physical health. And you're really surprised how bad, you know, how pretty low they are. You know, most of them have mild depression, you know, a lot of anxiety and no hope, a lack of hopelessness. So I think a top tip here would be is to send them some, there are a lot of outcome scores like Hago score, who score. So send them something like a PDF before to get them because once you got their answers, then you can explore that. I can, for example, a lot of them will say, you know, they're having very low mood. They're, you know, struggling with sleep and things like that. So you got that form in you. So I, I use that standard for the last two, three years. So always send them paperwork before, get the detailed history and sit with them and discuss those options because pretty much I've never seen a male or a female in the last few years who don't have a severe psychological impact, you know, this anxiety sleep. And also, I think the one key fact, there are two key things which they fear about. One is a lot of them fear they're going to have a hip replacement or they're going to end up having severe OA. So that's a common fear they have. So we need to reassure them a lot saying uh, a diagnosis of hip impingement doesn't mean that you're going to end up with the total hip replacement in five, 10 years. So a lot of assurance that it's not inevitable. So it's not a natural progression. And the another yeah, fear yeah. they have is, another fear they have is labral tear. So I say to them, a bit of labral tear is part of aging and that's not the main, uh, you know, indication of your uh, pr prognosis. If you keep the cartilage healthy, if you don't irritate it, you descend. So I think a lot of people are highly relieved when they hear that they are not going to get arthritis because that's a fear I see pretty much in everyone, you know, they're going to get mm -hmm. arthritis and when they're 45, they're going to need a new hip. So I think once you downplay, so a key questions which will help you is, so I, I'm sure all, all of us, we ask them these questions is what concerns you the most? So I always mm -hmm. ask that questions, what concerns you the most? And usually the number one answer they tell me is I'm going to get arthritis. So that is something we, we want to diffuse them on the first uh, session. Uh, sure, because, sure. The, the, because once until we diffuse them and de-stress them, they won't engage. Because if you're already worked up with your CNS and limbic system, you're not going to engage. And that could contribute to the pain massively, as we know, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the psychosocial impact, I think. So uh, tips for a novice, you know, somebody looking into this field, I would say is definitely use some screening questionnaires and uh, do sit with them and explore those options. Uh, you know, what are the biggest fears? And to reassure them that it's not... A diagnosis of hip impingement is not uh, like a sentence for uh, hip arthritis. Uh, if you look at the statistics, it's less than 10%. So 80 to 90% of them will not develop early OA. So only a small percentage of them will end up, uh, especially the ones who pick up late. So most of them will do well. Uh, and the main emphasis is obviously not all of them can be treated conservatively. So uh, some of them will need to go to surgery. 
uh, one of the most important decisions you would make if you're going for surgery is uh, choose your surgeon very carefully because it's a very niche area. It needs a high volume. So I only send to about eight to nine surgeons in the country whom I work with because they deal a lot with these conditions. And I know that, you know, they'll do well because of the high volume surgeon. So do uh, your uh, research. What, at what point, sorry to interrupt, Ben, at what point do you make a decision, say one of, you know, say one of these two guys was doing their, you know, they got to stage one, stage two, stage three. At what point do you say you're not, you're not getting there fast enough? Yeah. We need to send you off. What's, what's, yeah, your, so, what's your point? Yeah. So the that? timelines as per the literature is three months. So I'd give it a good three months to sort of, uh, they should have some change in three months. So if they're not improving three months, uh, we, I have another tool in my, you know, access is hip joint injection so i would send that to you know a couple of guys sports doctors and like somebody like suresh you know send for intraarticular hip injection so that in some people that's enough so if they fail three months and uh, they're having hip injection they're stressed the decision to send is purely based on symptoms so even after three months or even after injection they can't sit for 15 minutes you know they're they can't, they're limping uh, they're hopping around i think then we can't just drag this forever isn't it i, I don't want to drag this for yeah. six months nine months so I, I think if you're not improving three months um i think we should do something and i think most patients will get frustrated that you know i don't think patients will wait nowadays after three months is if they're not improving yeah yeah sure okay so i think i mean guys have you got anything to add thanks for your time by the way this evening have you got anything to add as, as sort of tips that you've learned from this as physios i think the positional aspect of it is very important being aware of what positions are going to aggravate it and you know um how far you can go with with certain exercises mm -hmm. that's really helped me because before i wasn't aware of it so now i am i can avoid aggravating it further okay good aiden what's your, your top tip that you can you've learned from all of this journey you've been on why don't you just have a very good clinician to, to guide you <laughs> <laughs> i think um uh, yeah, I think the, the best tip I could give is is trust in, in that process, you know, that having hip FAI or that diagnosis doesn't mean, like Ben I said, that you're going to have these things. Yes, it might be, you know, some, it's a slight risk factor, but it's just that. Um, and that you can have a, a high quality functioning life if you go through the process. Um, but just, yeah, get that hip calm in the early stages and, and try try not to push through the pain. Yeah, good stuff. Ben, um, I think we're going to draw it to a close. If anyone wants to get in touch with you about any questions on FAI or, or the many amazing courses you run, how do they get hold of you? Yeah, I think I'm, you must notice I'm quite uh, active on Twitter. Obviously not as active <laughs> as, as Instagram as Aiden. Uh, I'm trying to improve my Instagram skills. But yeah, so I'm doing uh, quite a few courses uh, in the UK. I'm doing in London, Scotland. So Twitter, you know, if you just Google my courses, you can see it through Vital. I'm doing in Belgium. It depends on whether they let me fly, you know. So generally, I do quite a few courses around. So happy to help. And I, I guess I go in detail for a day or two. I think the most difficult thing where is to really get to the bottom of the source of pain. Uh, once you know what the diagnosis is easier. So I think a lot of therapists struggle in that differential diagnosis. So I think I spent the whole day on the initial first half a day going through the differential diagnosis because is it back? Is it SIJ? You know, is it adductor? Is it hip flexor? Is it GTP? So once you get your idea around that, I yeah, think yeah. Your, your job makes a bit more. Uh, let's not go on the SIJ. You know, I don't touch it. I leave that to that <laughs> office. <laughs> but generally. Uh, <laughs> release the psoas. Release the psoas. <laughs> it sounds like release the kraken, doesn't it? What a load of By the way, just for clarity, guys, I don't believe you can release the psoas. It's a joke. It's a joke. Well, you can if you, you know, you get yourself a really long knife. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to record this, are we? I'm hoping. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. But as you guys, thank you guys for yeah. sharing, and hopefully, this uh, for giving up your evenings, and hopefully that. And the other thing is that, you know, this is a lifelong, you know, they know exactly what to do. If they spike the training volume or do something crazy with their bike ride, it will come back. So they know exactly they're in control. So yeah. uh, it's not a stop date, you know, so they know that the shape of the hip is not going to change, but they can change their lifestyle. And I think most people are happy because I don't, I've not met anyone who, was to, who wants to have surgery in the first instance. So yeah. most people are happy to make those changes. So thank you guys for uh, giving up your evening. Pleasure. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Very nice to meet you two young chefs. Good luck with everything. Thank you very much. What are we doing? Uh